Forgotten City, Chapter 20. Outside, Asha pulled Kobe away from the medical rooms. Some guardian stepped after her, but she said, Give him a minute. Where are the restrooms? They pointed, and she pulled him through a door into a corridor and into a cubicle. What are you? Kobe began, but she placed a finger to her lips. Her face was filled with urgency, eyes wide. She made sure the door was clicked shut, then whispered, I need to talk to you. She peered up up at him, her eyes filled with confusion. Kobe, something's going on and I don't understand. Go on. She seemed full of nervous energy. You know I can read the thoughts of people who have been contaminated with waste, right? Well, when I saw that man down there in the infirmary, Dr. Hales? I heard his voice. <clears throat> she tapped her head. In here. And what did he say? Asha lowered her voice. It was really clear, Kobe, he said. Get outside. They're lying to you. You need to see outside. Kobe heard the words in his own head, in Hale's voice. Are you sure? Asha nodded. Kobe leaned against the wall. He's telling us we need to escape. Asha chewed her lip. I don't know. It was very clear. He didn't say to run away. He said, see. You need to see outside. Kobe didn't understand. I've seen outside. It's just like everywhere else, a wilderness. Haven't you been in Melanie's office? No, of course not. We're not allowed. I have. I looked through the window. It's just miles and miles of... She's got a window, said Asha. Uh-huh, said Kobe. Asha was frowning. So why don't we? They said it was because of the waste, that walls were safer. Kobe shrugged. But you've been in the transports. Couldn't you see out of those? Asha shook her head. Same excuse, avoiding any risk of contagion. Kobe had to admit it was a bit weird. Still, he wasn't inclined to listen to anything Dr. Hales had to say. He didn't say it, though, did he? He thought it. And why would he lie to himself? Is there a way to get outside? He asked Asha. She nodded. They hurried out of the restroom along the corridor until they reached the elevator, but Asha went past and pushed through a pair of double doors with the fire escape sign above it. The door opened onto concrete stairs. Kobe peered up. No cameras. Hangar's top floor, right? 182. Asha nodded. We're on 151. That's a lot of climbing. Kobe began to jog up the first flight. Come on, then. Twenty floors later, enhanced strength and stamina or not, Kobe was tiring. Asha was flagging badly, and Kobe had to help her, then stop after each flight for a rest. They'd passed an internal door at every floor, and much as Kobe had wanted to look, it wasn't worth the risk. If there were alarms or cameras, they'd be found in seconds. As Kobe waited on the floor toward the top, the lactic acid draining from his thighs, he wondered again if this was a waste of time. Asha seemed so convinced of what Dr. Hales had said, but the man on the bed had hardly been in a fit state to communicate anything. Plus, Kobe had seen what was outside, and it was exactly like everywhere else, completely overrun. I don't think I can go, said Asha, sitting on a step. We're almost there, said Kobe. Four more flights. You go. If there's something there, you can... An alarm started wailing, startling them both, and red lights along the ceilings flashed. They're on to us, said Kobe. He hoisted Asha up to her feet as Melanie Garcia's voice said urgently, urgently over the speaker, we have a code four, two missing patients, all personnel respond. The frantic siren seemed to give Asha a jolt of strength and they set off again, Asha hauling herself with the banister as Kobe took two steps at a time. Doors banged farther below and he saw flashlight beams and arcs whipping up and down the stairwell. Then the thud of boots many floors down. He grabbed Asha's arm to help her. When they had two more floors to go, a door slammed not far below and Kobe saw three guardians emerge. They saw him too. Contact, contact, one shouted. They're heading to the roof. Kobe tugged Asha roughly up one more flight, then reached a door with the number 181. That's not right. There should be one more. For a brief second, he feared it might be locked, but as he felt the handle, it turned. It pulled open, and they bundled through. Asha gasped, and Kobe stopped dead, heels squeaking on the polished concrete floor. Facing him were row upon row of crouching snatchers, perhaps a hundred together. Kobe held his breath, but the snatchers did not move, deactivated. 
There were two transports on the far side of the hangar space, one flush against a wall, the other a few yards away. There was no obvious way out. Kobe knew they didn't have long. He ran, darting among the stationary snatchers with Asha trailing. As they made their way to the clo closest transport, Kobe almost tripped on a ridge in the ground. He stopped looking around. It was a circular section of flooring, maybe 30 feet across, slightly detached, looking up. The ceiling seemed to be made of some sort of sliding hatch with a cantilevered arm mechanism folded up. On the wall beside them was a panel of buttons. It's a takeoff pad. Stand back, he said, and he hit the green button. Straight away, the circle of ground juddered and began to rise. At the same time, the ceiling hatches slid back to reveal a growing patch of black night sky. Freeze, yelled a voice. Guards spilled out from the stairwell and red lasers flashed all around him. Wait for me, cried Asha. Poof, poof. Darts ricocheted off the snatcher's metal shells. Asha reached up and Kobe took her arms, lifting her onto the raising platform. They both crouched behind a snatcher, using it for cover. I wonder what dose their weapons are set to now. Probably enough to floor me right away. Stop them, Melanie's voice. And as Kobe turned, he saw her emerging from the elevator with Krenner and three other guards at her side. Poof, poof, poof. The darts all missed. As the platform rose, Kobe and Asha stayed low to avoid being hit. He was ready to run in whatever direction seemed most promising. Maybe across the rooftops, there might be trees he could climb down, slipping into the foliage. But then, as the night revealed itself, he couldn't move at all. Kobe felt dizzy, his muscles utterly drained. No, said Asha at his side. All he saw was gleaming metal and twinkling glass. Skyscrapers rising like gleaming spires toward the, bleh, toward the sky. Cars, sleek as bullets, sipping through the air. A train on a suspended track, looping between buildings, tunneling into their sides like a caterpillar. Giant holographic images flashing, showing people and clothes and food and faces. Kobe turned on the spot, reeling. It stretched for miles in every direction. Not a leaf in sight, not a speck of green. A perfect, waste-free city.